Hello, everyone. Um, uh, I'm sorry you had to wait till 10:15 uh, to see me again. Um, first of all, I want to invite everyone to come from the break. It's uh, always special to have a cabinet secretary um, address um, address any any audience, but uh, especially this cabinet secretary. Um, so important to this uh, energy transition to uh, remaking uh, the auto industry and making sure that we can compete into the future. But she's not just the cabinet secretary, the secretary of, of energy, but also the former governor of Michigan. And, and in the end, when one thinks of the United States, and we started this summit with the Arsenal of Democracy video, and the arsenal of democracy came out of Detroit and then Michigan. And without the auto industry, um, we would not have uh, been able to win World War II. Um, it was really Stalin, actually, who toasted the United States when he said that we, wore, we won this war on the octanes and the engines of the United uh, States. And so it is really important to remember that. And how we got into this, you know, of course, I talked yesterday how we were looking at oil dependence. But it was really that, that key question that the industrial capacity of every country in the Western world is, is driven by their auto sector. They're the ones who understand tooling and machining. And we saw that during the COVID when we didn't have, uh, we didn't have the... Uh, the ventilators, where did they turn? They turned to the auto industry and said, what do we do, how do we build these? And so that's why it's so important that we uh, get this right. It is that mental atrophy, it's that skill set that we have to continue to need. To need. And so we're particularly um, privileged to have uh, Secretary Jennifer Granholm with us. She is the 16th Secretary of uh, Energy. Um, Secretary Granholm, is really trying to achieve this net zero carbon emissions goal by 2050 by advancing cutting edge clean energy technologies and creating millions of good paying union jobs and building an equi equitable clean future. Um, the other thing with uh, Secretary Granholm is that we actually took Secretary Granholm to China with Admiral Blair for her first time. I didn't know that um, until today. Um, where we were able to see what the Chinese were doing, it had to be about 15 years ago. And at that point, the world was a very different place. And we looked around, and I think we all subtly understood that things were changing and this could be ultimately a problem. But I think it was uh, that experience, I hope, that uh, allowed her to really come to appreciate that. And those are the types of things we're trying to do at SAFE, which is expose not just ourselves, but others to uh, these geopolitical challenges early on so we can deal with them uh, before they become uh, crises. So with that, uh, please, uh, let's welcome Secretary Granholm. Thank you so much, uh, Robbie. I, I actually uh, like to tell the story of going to China with SAFE because, um, you know, when I was Governor of Michigan, big manufacturing state, obviously, doing a whole lot in supply chains as well as the OEMs, the auto OEMs. Um, all of the folks who were manufacturing widgets in whatever way uh, were trying to China-proof their products at that point. How do they compete against China? So when I went to uh, China with SAFE, it was so, um, you know, it was really frightening in many ways because I remember at one point, Robbie, there was a, we went to a, a demonstration with a, a bunch of mayors, Chinese mayors, who were um, talking about what was happening in clean energy in their cities. And, uh, it, you know, they were all getting up and, you know, boasting about what was happening. And I was standing in the back and next to one of the mayors, and I apologize for some of you have heard me tell this story before, but he leans over to me and he says, so when is the United States going to get federal energy policy? And I was like, oh, Congress, it's so hard. And he just looks at me and he smiles and he says, take your time. Take your time. Because they saw, of course, our passivity as their opportunity. And look what has happened. Um, in fact, governors in trying to compete to get investment uh, in our states, it was like bringing a knife to a gunfight. There's no way a single state could compete and we didn't have 
federal strategy to be able to build up these supply chains, these manufacturing opportunities inside the United States. And so uh, <laughs> we are at this amazing moment right now. We have got it. You know, this is the president has said we are not going to stand by and watch all of these jobs leave. We are going to create a manufacturing backbone in the United States. We're going to reshore rather than offshore. We are not going to just be passive bystanders as our economic competitors go after our businesses. And so I, I just, I mean, as for, you know, I was governor during the Great Recession, the bankruptcies of the auto industries, and prior to the, of the bankruptcy of the auto makers, and prior to that was the bankruptcies of so many of the supply chain and all, so much offshoring of jobs. I just tell you, this is really what SAFE is doing. This is so powerful in the industrial pockets of America. It is so powerful. And so let me just, I'm coming to give you, uh, I know you've all been talking about this, just a bit of progress report from our perspective at the Department of Energy. Um, so far, since the passage of Bill and Ira, 600 new or expanded clean energy manufacturing plants all across America. 600. Now, if you can imagine, in a lot of these places, manufacturing that went away was the economic engine of a community, of small communities in particular. The fact that we are reshoring and expanding and creating a huge opportunity in all pockets of the country is, uh, it's not just a, a, an economic and national security imperative. It is a gift to these communities all across the country as well. Tens of thousands of good paying jobs all across America. Meanwhile, as I'm sure you were just talking about, 1.4 million EVs sold last year, quadruple since 2021, 900 new chargers coming online every week. What is the latest number they were talking about? 170,000 uh, chargers online. We expect 500,000 by the end of 2026. By 2030, we know because of this Invest in America agenda that we are going to uh, be 80% of the way toward 100% clean electricity by 2035. So 80% clean electricity by 2030 as a result of the policy that was adopted, 40% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2030, and that's just from IRA and Bill. That doesn't include the actions of state and local governments and the private sector. We think we could be at 50% when you combine all of that in. 65%, our, our modelers tell us, 65% of the cars sold in 2030 will be electric. And of course, this is not happening by accident. For those of you who worked on getting these bills adopted, Thank you. This is not coincidence. Who knew that policy actually works? Isn't it great? Oh, my God. We're, we have now, proud to say, I mean, it used to be the people ran away from the notion of having an industrial strategy. We have a national industrial strategy right now. The most significant climate and clean energy bills in the history of the nation, arguably in the world. So many reasons why what is happening is the direction that we've got to head in. And of course, uh, the invasion of Ukraine and Putin's weaponization of energy. We all know what OPEC has done to manipulate prices and uh, supply. We've seen what China uh, has been doing to manipulate uh, the and just say corner the market, bigfoot the market in these clean energy technologies. We know that clean energy represents a $23 trillion global economic opportunity with every country making these pledges to be able to move in the direction of clean energy. And the question is, who is going to take advantage of that demand? And we know that China has numerous, you know, five-year plans that they have been adopting to be able to take advantage of it. And now we have a plan to. We are no longer, we are no longer passive. So the president's uh, industrial strategy really mirrors, I think, a lot of what SAFE has been at advocating for over decades. I just feel like, Robbie, this is, you know, sort of the, the uh, I don't want to say culmination, but certainly the fulfillment of so much of your life's work uh, in making this happen from a policy perspective. 
Um, you know, this uh, strategy is going to do, obviously, an enormous amount for our uh, economic security and for our energy security and for our national security, but it will do a whole lot for these, for these communities and workers along the way. There's three pillars that we have been focused on. One is that these laws are making America the irresistible nation, irresistible to a, in attracting clean energy investments. We are taking a government-enabled, private sector-led approach, and working to, with companies to identify their risks and opportunities, breaking down barriers, and then using the funding and other tools to fill the gaps between the uh, tax credits and the grant opportunities and the loan opportunities. We have a suite of tools to make companies competitive in the United States in manufacturing here. Just look at, uh, I know you've been talking about critical minimum roles, and I'm not going to beat a dead horse on that, but battery supply chains, um, super important, uh, obviously, in the, uh, in the suite of electrification. Uh, we got $7 billion at the Department of Energy from the infrastructure law to build up our supply chains uh, for battery from soup to nuts. We have awarded half of it to 15 companies so far, and with their cost share, it's in that first chunk, uh, it's about $6 billion investment in the United States in battery supply chain, and we have another $3.5 billion to award. We're in the second round of funding for that. And in all of that, our manufacturing and energy supply chains office has been identifying where are the gaps, what are the minerals, what are the components of batteries that we need to be filling in, especially, and funding the companies to be able to fill those gaps. We've been obviously helping Treasury uh, with uh, impl to implement the game-changing tax credits that make it uh, a no-brainer to set up shop here. And as a result of those 600 factories that I said started up in the United States, 400 of them are battery and EV factories related. So, uh, you know, and, and plus, uh, if China right now it controls 65% of the lithium processing and almost 100% of graphite. Because of these investments, the U.S. lithium production is projected to increase 13-fold by 2030 and 25-fold for graphite, same, same time period. We are fighting back to get every piece of the supply chain back in the United States or with our allies. So, making America irresistible. Second is equity. Equity is super important for us, and it's super important for the nation. When I say that, I mean, we're putting the people and the communities that have historically left, been left behind at the forefront of this new clean energy economy. The president uh, prioritizes this, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the only way to make this clean energy transition uh, succeed. When people are part of deciding their future, if they're at the table, then the path for permitting, for siting, for growing these projects will result in, in fewer lawsuits, in less friction, in more certainty, and in better results. So how are we doing this? For companies that are uh, seeking federal tax credits, again, thanks to the way these tax credits have been designed, there's extra kicker if you locate in a disadvantaged community this clean energy project. Um, and, and it continues to stack depending on what else you do in that project. For companies that are seeking loans and grants, we require entities uh, to submit a community benefits plan, and their loan or, or grant proposal is evaluated based upon that, that plan. For, for grants, 20% of the grant is, is weighted by this community benefits plan, and it is working. Studies have shown since the start of Bill and Ira and this strategy, uh, two times the investments have gone to disadvantaged communities relative uh, to their population as compared to, to other regions. So that is working. So equity is the second pi pillar, and the third is jobs. And you know, we, we are uh, really interested, obviously, in quality 
quality jobs, and here too, there's an incentive on that. We want a workforce that's going to be able to uh, support these, these growing clean energy technologies. We have to plan to have the right skill set uh, five, 10, 20 years down the line. It's why we have focused on making these jobs accessible and attractive and competitive. Right now, 75% of these clean energy jobs that will be created uh, do not require a college degree, but may require some kind of technical uh, certification in some way, shape, or form. Uh, we're funding workforce development programs and uh, helping to develop these standardized training modules. I'll have more to say about this uh, next week, but we, we have a national battery workforce initiative that uh, we are partnered on to make sure that we've got the right skill set and that can be moved to play, the initiative itself can be adopted in places all over the country. And we're prioritizing good pay and competitive benefits and the free and fair chance to join a union as well. We offer extra tax incentives to pay workers prevailing wage and to use uh, uh, registered apprentices. So here again, it's working. Those 400 battery and EV factories are creating more than 130,000 jobs in less than three years. So you put it all together and what happens is like what's happening in Moses Lake, Washington. I was just there uh, last month. And in Moses Lake, which is a population of about 25,000, it's uh, further east in Washington state, it's an agricultural community. And um, in Moses Lake, since President Biden took office, four companies have announced plans to invest almost a billion dollars in six manufacturing plants for batteries and solar. I visited uh, Sela Nanotechnologies in Group 14. They both are manufacturing silicon anodes uh, for batteries, so the EVs can charge faster and with less reliance upon graphite uh, from China. And just those two plants are creating 350 jobs in Moses Lake, uh, whether they're engineers or process operators or lab technicians, all kinds of jobs for all kinds of people, plus up to 600 construction jobs, um, which is fantastic. And as part of their community benefits plans, those companies are investing in workforce development partnerships with local schools. And already uh, last year, 80% of Group 14's hires were from the community. This is a, you know, it's an economic cluster that is being created in Little Moses Lake where previously the best jobs, or many of the jobs, I should say the best jobs, but many of the jobs were in, in farming and agriculture. And now they have, they're transitioning to diversify their economy and provide these future-facing jobs for their people. Fantastic. So, you know, that Moses Lake is just one of hundreds of communities across the, the country that are benefiting from this agenda, this invest in America agenda, make it in America agenda, make sure that we uh, as a nation are strong and have a manufacturing backbone. Because uh, thanks to this industrial strategy, instead of importing battery components from China, we're gonna build anodes in Washington, cathodes in Tennessee, separator material in Indiana, electrolytes in Texas. Instead of importing solar panels, we are gonna be manufacturing our own in Georgia and Alabama and Ohio, in a formerly shuttered plant in Lordstown, Ohio, we're building EV batteries in a formerly shuttered plant in Hamtramck, Michigan. We're building EBs. The U.S. is back, baby. <laughs> we are the envy of the world. If I talk to any of my counterparts across the world, they're like, oh my God, how do we, how do we get some of this? I'm like, you guys should do it too. You know, you can adopt these kind of incentives. There's enough work to go around to get to the big goal of net zero by 2050. So we, uh, we are the envy of the world, but let me say this, to those of you who worked on these laws, we cannot take this progress for granted. We cannot give up the gains of the past three years, the decades of hard work by, by SAFE and people in this room that helped to deliver those achievements. I know 
you all, because you've been working on this, understand these consequences for our national security, for our energy security, for our communities, for the planet. And let me just say, President Biden, he understands these consequences too. He gets it. And I'm gonna let that sit for a moment because that's no guarantee in a president. So whatever your role is, do not take this new momentum for granted. We are in the middle of history. And like most turning points in history, this is a battle for the ages. My counterpart in Ireland, Minister Eamon Ryan, has noted that countries fighting for clean energy independence, especially as he considers the weaponization of, of fuel in Europe, countries fighting for clean energy independence may be in fact engaged in the greatest peace plan the world has ever known. And I am so grateful to be writing that plan alongside you. Thank you all so much.